Hey guys, Brandon Harvey here. And before we get started today, I wanted to tell you about a very important survey we're conducting here at Sounds Good. And we'd really like for you to participate. The survey is anonymous, it won't take much time, and it will help us learn more about you, no matter how long you've been a listener or how frequently you listen to the show. So please take a few minutes and go to gradient.is slash podcast survey and let us know what you think. Again, that's gradient.is slash P-O-D-C-A-S-T S-U-R-V-E-Y. All right, now here's the show. Hello, hello, Brandon Harvey here with this week's episode of Sounds Good, the podcast where every single Monday I sit down with an inspiring person and talk about happiness, overcoming struggles, and living a life of intentionality and wonder. Today, I am psyched to introduce you to David Nelson. David Nelson is a football player, currently a free agent wide receiver in the NFL. He played college football for the University of Florida, where he was a member of two BCS national championship teams before he was signed by the Buffalo Bills as an undrafted free agent in 2010 and also played for the New York Jets. In the midst of his NFL career, David became passionate about helping orphans in Haiti and started a nonprofit called I'm Me that's working to help orphans around the world in a unique and holistic way. This is a super fun conversation, so let's just jump straight into it. All right, I am on the line with David Nelson. David, welcome to Sounds Good. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to you today, uh, but I really want to start off by being very, very clear with some uh, disclosure. (laughs) I don't know Uh very much about sports in general. Uh, (laughs) And so uh, I don't care all that much about the NFL, but I do care about you, and I think you're amazing. But if I say something dumb about football, um, I 100% encourage you to laugh at me and then correct me. <laughs> so do I have permission to call you out when this when that does happen? Oh, please do, please. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I, I actually prefer that. I actually prefer <laughs> conversations with people who don't, because I don't, you know, when I meet somebody, I'm not introducing myself as an athlete. You know, that's my world 90% of the time, and so it's nice and it's comforting just to be able to have a conversation and not have to dive into that and just have, you know, hopefully I can communicate and. And, and have conversations with people in different spectrums. So Good. Let's. Uh, you. You. You're fine as long as you're watching the Olympic Olympics and you're cheering for Team USA. Oh, absolutely, man! I've been geeking out over the Olympics. It's been amazing. It's been amazing. Oh, There's been so, so many good, good stories. Oh man, yeah. I've been having a hard time keeping up with all the stories, and I'm excited to just kind of go back through and just read through everything over the next few weeks, and then who knows? Maybe they'll be on the show soon. That's it. There you go. And that's, that's not to get too far into it, but that's the beauty of sports, man. Yeah. It, you, it, it unites people. It's not necessarily something that is going to uh, always you know, bring world peace, but at the same time, it's an aspect. You look at Kansas City last year when they won the World Series, all the craziness going on, but you had mm. 300,000 people all wearing the royal blue together. You had Muslims, you had Christians, you had atheists all together celebrating and, and rallying behind one central theme, and that's their team, and that's what's been so beautiful. Man. just seeing people rally behind in the Olympics with everything going on, no matter what country or what continent you're in, rallying behind this um, uniting front, which is you know sports, competition, but also at the same time sportsmanship. And that's been just so beautiful to see. Man, that's so unreal. That's perfectly said. And I feel like you got a really good taste of this growing up because you grew up in Texas where you bleed football. And as somebody coming from the world that's totally outside of football, I would love to have a little bit more of an understanding of what the trajectory for somebody heading off to the NFL looks like as a kid. Like what was it look, what was your life like as a kid leading up to you one day ending up in the NFL? Yeah, man, you know, that's an interesting dynamic because, like you said, I, I grew up in the heart of Texas. And for any of everybody who knows anything about football, I mean, f- football in Texas is king. I mean, you got 
uh, you can look at the movie Friday Night Lights. You can look at it, just so many different uh, examples that will just show you that football is king. And if you are, uh, like, for example, I mean, businesses will shut down for their local high school games <laughs> on Friday nights. It, it's insane. And, and it's just, uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's an awesome dynamic, but also at the same time, it can present a lot of pressure. And so you have, from an early age, I mean, there's high school coaches who are scouting six and seven year old kids in Pop Warner to see maybe their <laughs> the who's going to be their quarterback you know 14 years from now oh my and gosh. so it is it's crazy and you got the dads in the stands who maybe in their day played high school football and they're still wearing their letter jacket or maybe their state championship ring and so then they're <laughs> maybe that's as far as they made it and so they're hoping that their son can maybe push a little further and so they're pushing their kids and so it is it's crazy but you know i grew up and um you know, sports has been the, a huge part of my life since I was a kid. Uh, it's something that I excelled in at an early age. My dad was an athlete growing up. My mom was an athlete growing up. Um, and so it was something that from day one, I have a picture of myself actually when I was like two years old. I just learned how to walk and I have a McDonald's t-shirt on and I'm carrying this basketball. I'm just dribbling a ball. And so from an early age, it was just, it just I guess, innately in me. Uh, so much so in first grade, I actually wrote for Mother's Day our teacher had us do a, a, a project or a, a assignment that basically was just writing to our parents, letting them know what we wanted to be in the future, writing to our mom, letting them know what we wanted to do in the future. And my mom actually pulled this letter out a couple of years ago for Mother's Day and read it back to me. And the gist of the letter basically said that I wanted to be, I wrote to my mom and said, Mom, I want to be a starting point guard for the Dallas Mavericks, a starting pitcher for the Texas Rangers, and a starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> All of the above. For, <laughs> and so from an early age, I've had my, I, my sights and my eyes set on being a professional athlete. And you know, to be honest with you, a lot of it was because I saw these athletes. I saw them as the measure of success. I saw mm. them as the, uh, the pinnacle of, of what it looks like to do what you want in life and to get what you want, to have what you want. I wasn't necessarily idolizing and having the, the ones who were the best at what they do per se and, and using those as my role models. It's more of the guys that were using their platform and using their uh, influence on the field and letting that transcend and to make an impact in people's lives off the field. Um, and just being able to see how people were captivated by them and how they were able to captivate, whether it be an audience or a crowd or just the people that were around them. And so, you know, I never really dreamed of becoming a professional athlete for you know, money and, and the influence. It was to, you know, I always saw the guys that after training camp for the Dallas Cowboys that would come over and sign autographs for an hour afterwards with all the fans and giving back to the fans. And, mm. you know, I was told myself, if I can get to that point, that's where I want to be. And so, you know, just growing up in that. And so, honestly, I'm still a skinny kid. <laughs> but growing up, I was, I was extremely skinny. And so my parents weren't really uh, very, very comfortable with letting me play football at an early age. And so I grew up playing soccer, mm. uh, basketball, baseball. Pretty much if it had a ball besides a football, I played it until about eighth grade. And so I started playing football in eighth grade. Uh, first time I ever touched the football was a punt return, scored a touchdown the first time I touched it. And the coach started to realize that I had potential there. I grew up wanting to be a basketball player. And tall and skinny and had the build and the body for it um, and just slowly developed into a football player and it wasn't until my sophomore year that I started getting scholarship offers and really started to focus in on that and it's all led me into the place that I'm now and here I am six years later uh, you know as a professional athlete. Amazing amazing and you went to what what college did you go to again? The University of Florida. I'm a Gator. Amazing okay and what did you study in school when you uh, when you weren't playing football? I got my psychology, I got a double major, psychology and sociology. Interesting. Was there any particular reason you picked that? Is that was that a passion of yours or well, uh, to be honest with you, <laughs> it started out, sociology is also known as the athlete's degree. Uh, <laughs> and so it started out, and the fu interesting story, I actually had originally committed and decided to go to Notre Dame uh, mm. after my, in my junior year. And so I was going to go there because I wanted to study kinesiology. I've always been fascinated by the body and how it works and how it moves. And obviously kinesiology is a study of the muscles and just how the body moves and works. And my mom's a physical therapist. And so just seeing her help and, 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 and you know, improve the quality of life and well-being of people just through the muscles and through movement um, and so I chose Notre Dame because they have one of the best kinesiology departments in the country and then realized that I had potential to maybe play beyond college I never really believed in myself that was an issue I had growing up was I was always 
I was excelled, but I always put myself in a smaller capacity and smaller uh, realm than I guess I was really playing in. Hmm. And so I never really believed I had the ability to play in the NFL, just wanted to go and play at a high level and say that I did it. And so when I started to kind of fully, fully realize that is when I started to make the decision, I chose Florida. And I wasn't the best students my first couple of years, and so I had to settle for sociology. And so when I started to go into the sociology classes, I started to take um, some psych classes and really started to develop a, a, a liking for that and a real passion for that, just how the mind works and how different um, different things that happen in people's lives that, that shape the way they are now and so just fell in love with it and so started to work my way back into it and um, and all said and done four and a half years later I walked out with two two degrees well done well done and then straight out of college you jumped into the NFL and you've played for six years in the NFL right six years that's right incredible what what's been the highlight of that time I would on, honestly, because it's, and I love how you you, know, you prefaced it at the beginning how you don't know a lot about sports in general, <laughs> but it's it's uh, you know looking at it now six years in, it can look like and it can you can always get start to get caught in in okay what's next okay well what am I going to do next what's the next big thing I can do and and you know I've just been ha- I've had some, a lot of amazing people in my life that have just told me just to focus on the moment, just to be be present, um, be where you are and appreciate where you are. Um, a big uh, scene, my favorite movie scene of all time is at a Rocky three. I don't know if you've ever seen Rocky, but there's like 17 of them. <laughs> and so in, in Rocky three, um, he is sparring. He's getting ready for his, his big bout against um, a, a Mr. T, which is Clubber Lang in that. And he's actually sparring with his old nemesis, which is the guy who he beat and had also beaten him in the previous uh, two movies. And so you get into this scene and it's a day where Rocky's now the heavyweight champion is about to go into this bout with Clubber Lang and it's this big, huge heavyweight. It's like Ali Frazier. It's like this big, big deal. And for whatever reason, Rocky is like, he, they call him the Italian stallion. He's just a little short Italian dude that just has a heart of a lion, just hmm. overcomes. He came from nothing and worked his way. And so now he's a heavyweight champion, not because of necessarily talent, but because of his work ethic and because of how he approaches the game. And approaches the the ring, and but for whatever reason, this day his wife was in attendance at practice. He wasn't feeling very good. There's a lot going on in his life, and uh, in this scene, this little thirty second scene, and so he's sparring with this former heavyweight champion, and he just doesn't have it. And Apollo starts to challenge him. He's like, "Come on, Rock! Like, what's wrong with you?" And Rocky responds to him and says, "Man, tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow." And Apollo Creed responds back to him, which is kind of. I guess exemplifies kind of how I've approached my uh, professional life. Of, and he responds with, there is no tomorrow. And he says it about two or three times. And it's a challenge to Rocky in that moment that there's nothing that, when he steps into the ring for the actual match, it wasn't one there. It was one each and every single day. Every day that he wakes up and steps into practice, that day is a gift. That day is an opportunity. That day is something that you cannot, that cannot be taken from you. And so it's only in your control what you can do. And so that scene, and that's how I approach, and my favorite part, and what I've been able to do is just appreciate every practice, every day, every film session, every weight room workout, everything we've done, and just taking it with a grain of salt. Because I wasn't drafted, I didn't have the opportunity to step into the league and have this thing given to me. I had to earn my way. I started from the bottom of the roster, earn my way onto the team, uh, and had to earn my way into the starting spot. And even now, I have to continually fight for my job. But I'm not going to let the business side of it or the, you know, the expectations or the pressure take away for something, take away something that I've been dreaming of my entire life and take away something that's so beautiful if you really just appreciate the day and appreciate the process. And so that's something, you know, it's not about touchdowns. It's not about the, the money or anything like that. For me, it's about, you know, each and every single day that I had the opportunity to go out there with my teammates and with my uh, coaches and to be able to wear jerseys and represent the organizations and the team and the fans and be able to go out there and do what I love to do. Man, that's so cool. I That was so well said, and you definitely just talked me into watching Rocky because somehow I've never seen Rocky. Never? None of them? None of Well, I mean, oh. I've seen whatever the newer ones are. Uh, I haven't seen Creed yet. I've heard great things about Creed. I don't know how I've never gotten around to it. 
You got, oh man, it's, that's not even a sports <laughs> thing. That's like a man thing. That's, you got to get into that. And you got, I mean, cause it is just, it's like I said, it's that, it's that typical David versus Goliath story. Yeah. But it's also got some love in there and it's also got some, you know, fighting in there. But at the, th- at the same time, it's just about a man who, who has a will to win and then just to, will do whatever he can. Just people rallying behind that. And it's just so beautiful. Cause that's what life really is. And, and if looked at the right way. Man, okay, you've got me convinced then. <laughs> um, Le- do it and let me know. Oh, I you're, will. You're going to do a whole podcast about it. You're going to exactly. start doing the Rocky series. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, yeah, we're transitioning this entire podcast into the Rocky podcast in just a number of it. weeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, man, I want to ask you about Haiti. So you've been to Haiti how many times? Oh, gosh. Uh, close to 100? Maybe? No. Oh yeah. I don't know oh, if yeah. I've been I don't know if there's cities that I've lived in that I've been to a hundred times. Well that's not <laughs> I don't know if that's a real statement. But <laughs> I mean, because sometimes in since two thousand and twelve, I mean at some point for the past yes, for the past four years, I've gone at least once a month. And so you do twelve times four. I mean that's um 48, 48, I, mean, I wasn't a math major, but 48 times. So that's just that. And there's some times where I would go for a couple of days and come back and maybe go like four or five times during a month. Man, that's unreal. Okay. And so what first drew you to Haiti? And so you said you went the first time in 2012? 2012. Yep. Okay. And, uh, and that was a few years post the big earthquake that totally rocked Haiti. I don't think I even knew what Haiti was until that earthquake came along. What inspired you to go for the first time in 2012? You know what's funny about that is I didn't either. <laughs> I actually, well, I take that back. I had a teammate of my at Florida who was Haitian. And, you know, I'd heard the coaches tell us stories a lot about how one of our assistant coaches had to fly to Haiti, I guess, and, and sign papers. And it was like a crazy scene. Oh, wow. He got shot at a couple of times. And so I always saw Haiti as like this ghetto, crazy uh, just what you see on TV, like in Taken and stuff like that. And so never really had any desire to go and never really knew what, what it was. And as I was doing actually training for uh, the draft, I remember sitting on TV and watching CNN. And they were, uh, it was in 2010, talking about the earthquake and just the devastation. I mean, it was the the largest catastrophe, the largest death toll as far as a catastrophe in history, in the history Unreal. of the world. And just watching it and just seeing it and just because of the infrastructure and everything, it was just crazy. And so, and honestly, even then, you know, it, yeah, it impacted me and yeah, I was praying and, and, and feeling for the people. My heart went out to them, but I still didn't have a, you know, a, a desire or a passion for it. And so uh, I started playing in the NFL and played two years and had started to develop a platform and started to develop a base and I uh, had really established myself and felt like it was time to now use that to help others or use that to, um, you know, maybe speak on others' behalf. So whatever that looked like, didn't know. So I just started to explore. So I started to, uh, you know, get involved with local organizations and, and then a church from back home actually had called and said, hey, we're taking a trip to Haiti and uh, over Memorial Day, would you like to come? It was just a very basic general ask. And I you know, had the weekend off and didn't have anything to do and always wanted to go abroad and do something like that in a mission trip capacity and just never had the time. And so ended up flying to Haiti and meeting them there and spent the week there um, playing with kids. They, they have an orphanage, about 100 kids. And the whole week, man, I mean, you just drop a soccer ball and kids just come out of nowhere and they're just flying around and they can't speak the same language as you. And some of them haven't eaten in a few days, but they don't care. They just see a soccer ball and they just want to play. And so, man, for about a, a week long, we were just playing a week over the weekend. We were just playing with those kids and just having fun and loving on them. And I uh, really felt something there. I wouldn't say that I was felt, I felt called there. I wouldn't say that I felt a passion or a heart for that country, but just felt something there. And on my way back, we were leaving. It's about a four hour drive from the place we were to the airport. And I remember we got about 30 minutes away from the airport and we're gassing up the, the truck. And I look across the street and I see a little boy. And um, in 2012, even still now to some extreme, in 2012, it was still, it looked like it was the day after the earthquake, if you know what I mean. I mean, mm. there was still just devastation. There was still, um, you know, buildings were crumbled and crushed. And it looked like, the, like if you were to walk 
into Haiti the day after the earthquake, I felt like that's what it looked like in 2012 when we were there. And this ex specific example, a uh, little boy was stuck on some rebar, which is a little beam that comes from the concrete houses that hold him up, and was so lethargic because he hadn't eaten or didn't have any water or anything like that. So lethargic that he couldn't pull himself off of the rebar. And so I, the typical American mindset, ran across the street, pulled him off of the rebar, asked him if he, you know, I had a cliff bar in my left pocket and, you know, I had some bubbles in my right pocket and uh, just asked him basically because I knew he hadn't eaten anything. And so I was like, hey, do you want some food? Do you just like to eat? And he looked at me and he said, no. And I was like, well, you know, we got about five minutes until we, until we leave. We got about five minutes until we, uh, the canter's all gassed up. So would you like to play? Add some bubbles. Do you want to play? And he looked up at me and he said, no. I said, well, you know, what do you want? Because in my American mindset or in my, you know, comfortable mindset, I was thinking, well, how can I serve you? How can totally. I love you? If you don't want me to give you anything, like, what do you, what do you <laughs> want, kid? And so he just proceeded just to look at me. And I still will never forget those eyes. I'll never forget uh, just the way he <laughs> just stood there. Uh, he plainly put his arms in the air and just said, hold me. And mm. it was uh, something that just has changed my life. For, for the better. And it showed me for maybe the first time what love really looks like. It, it transcends language. It um, is, is <laughs> for my opinion, is the greatest human need because here is this boy who didn't know what he was gonna eat that night, didn't know where he was gonna sleep that night, didn't know if he was gonna live or die in the next day or two, but in that moment, even though being presented with opportunities to eat and drink and play, his greatest need was to be loved. And even further than that, his greatest desire was to be known and to have somebody hold him and to see him. And for five minutes, he knew that he mattered. For five minutes, he knew that somebody saw him. And so it was in that moment that uh, I left and called my brothers. We then went back to Haiti a week later. They s experienced the same thing. And so from that is where this organization and where my heart for Haiti has, has come from. You were just hooked on it. I was hooked. I mean, <laughs> I, it was like one of those things where uh, I, everything that I've been looking for and everything that I was hoping to do, it's one of those things where it, it humbles you. And it mm. really, uh, it, even though, you know, I never really would say that I've, I've had like an idolatry or a, a um, you know, a, a, a unhealthy approach to money or fame or whatever it may be. But also at the same time, it's, you know, I definitely was comfortable and I definitely was caught in my own ways and, and saw myself up here and saw him down there. And, you know, he was an orphan and I was uh, the oldest of eight kids with a mother and a father and a professional athlete. And who wants my autograph? And I was there to serve them. I was there to teach them. I was there to do something for them because I was the one who had to figure it out, right? I mean, I'm the one who has the influence and the money and the ability to do so. And I walked away rocked because my life was changed by a four-year-old orphan kid who didn't care who, what my name was, didn't care how many Twitter followers I had, didn't care what my job was. He just cared that I was a person. And he Dang. cared that I had a heart. And so that was something that rocked my world. And when I came back, I now saw things differently. I saw relationships differently. It was no longer about what I could get out of it or what could come about it. It was seeing people for what they are. And that's beautiful. And that's that each person was born with purpose and for purpose. And so it's, it, yes, Haiti, I was hooked to Haiti, but also hooked to that dynamic of relationships and love and service. That's cool. And I like that you, you had already admired people who were using their platform to make a difference, but you didn't quite have your thing yet. And, and maybe you just needed something to kind of hit you over the head to be like, oh, like I, here's, here's a way that I can do that. And, you know, right. if you had ended up getting an invitation to some totally different country or had done something else, I have no doubt that you would have found that in some other way, you know, whether it's in Haiti or not. But it, it's so cool that that's what it ended up being. And you've just gone all in on it. You're exactly right. And, and I had no idea. I, I knew it'd be, honestly, I knew it'd be something around kids because I've always loved kids. Like I said, I'm the oldest of eight. I'm 29 years old now. My youngest sister is nine. And so every three or four years, there's a new baby in the family. I have two <laughs> younger brothers who are married with two with kids of their own. And so I'm always constantly surrounded by kids and babies. And, you know, I may have the, may have the uh, intellectual capacity of a 15 year old, but I always like to act like I'm five or six. And so you know, I, just, <laughs> I, I just love being around kids. And so even when I was exploring different vessels and different opportunities. It always had something to do with kids. 
And so, you know, people ask me constantly, it's like, well, that's great that you found your thing, but what's mine? And that's what I'm so passionate about is not necessarily pushing people to my cause and pushing people to what I do, but elevating them and promoting them and help, helping them find their voice and their passion and just finding out what that is and just to go out and do and to take risk and to step out in faith and step out and the, uh, make yourself uncomfortable. Because like you said, I mean, I, I could have went to any country in the world and in some way been ignited by that dynamic. And so that's what's been so beautiful about all of this is be able to use my story, not necessarily to push people towards my organization and towards orphans in Haiti, but to push people into their calling and push people into something that maybe they never knew they were capable of. And that's what's just been, I, I love that more than anything. That's huge. And so your organization is called I'm Me, lowercase I'm uppercase me what yeah. does uh what does that mean tell me the backstory behind that name yeah and it all stems from uh that encounter i have with that little boy which you know i've tried and i've never been able to locate him never mm. never found him again and so i'll never be able to shake that kid's hand and say thank you because he's changed my life and you know what a story about well, <laughs> what an incredible story that is yeah and it's, it's a quote by uh dr seuss actually in the movie the lorax oh and, uh, where it talks about how there's a little seed and this old man who was actually the reason why they didn't have seeds anymore but now was in search for the seed and he finds it and the kids are all laughing at him he's like that's what you've been looking for and he look he holds it up and he says look not at what it is but what it can become and so we believe, and I believe firmly that every person, every child was born for purpose, with purpose, by purpose. And that every person, every story, every voice matters. And so when we started to then travel around the world, we started to see that of the 167 million orphans in the world, actually 80% of them have a mother and or father alive somewhere. And so we started to see that there was an identity crisis. We started to see that there was you know, children who wanted to be other kids because maybe they would get adopted if that were the case. They started to see kids who wanted uh, this possession because that would bring them more value, that would bring them more comfort. And so I'm me basically what it is what it is. It's I am who I am, I was created with purpose, for purpose, by purpose. And at the end of the day, specifically with us, because we deal with orphan kids, we want every child to stand up and to be able to proclaim boldly and with confidence and authority and say, I am me and I am proud of who I am, I know who I am. I don't need to be anybody else because I was created with uh, a divine purpose and I am beautiful, I am loved and I am cherished and I am known. And so that's what it is and it's all about, hey, I am who I am and I have, yes, I'm an NFL athlete and I have a platform, but at the same time, you are you. And so who are you and how can you utilize and be who you are to help others or to serve others or to ignite others like that little child. He didn't try to be anybody else. Didn't try to be what the typical, I mean, most orphan kids who live in orphanages are taught to put on a show so that maybe they can get adopted or whatever. This little boy didn't put on a show. He was who he was and he was honest and sincere in that moment and it changed my life. And so for now we go around the world, we promote that. Man, so you went into this with passion. You know, you, you this was something that you cared about and that was kind of ignited by an experience. You went in with purpose knowing, hey, I want to do something bigger than myself. And I think a lot of people, if they were to just approach like, I want to make a difference in the world with just passion and purpose, they can do a lot of things wrong. They can actually do a lot of <laughs> like bad things. And you talked about this earlier about like your American mindset. What are some things you've had to <laughs> unlearn through the whole process? And what are some things that you've been super intentional about making sure you do in the process of, you know, helping kids find their families and adoption and uh, making this organization make a genuine impact? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's such, that is such a great question. And that is something that, um, honestly, I wasn't aware of at the beginning because like you said, you can get so, uh, enamored and you can get so blinded by passion and that you just, this is what I want to do and I'm going to go and do it. And so then you can be kind of, kind of become like a bull in a China shop. Um, and I don't know, honestly, I, I wish I could take credit for, it. I don't know what it, maybe it was my brother's guidance or something. 
But for whatever reason, even when we decided to do this and decided to establish this and create the 501c3 and, and, and go out and do this, as at the time I was 26, I was a football player. I had no experience starting a nonprofit. My younger brother uh, was 23, had no experience running a nonprofit. And then the one in between us was 24. He was a teacher. He had no experience either. Neither one of us knew anything about it, but we knew we wanted to do it. And so we did, uh, it, was, it was a quote by Gandhi and it's, I'm subphrasing, obviously, but it basically says that if you expect people to follow you and to trust you and to believe in you, you have to walk in their footsteps. And so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to go and sleep where they slept. We wanted to go eat where they ate. We wanted to go and, and live where they live. And so we traveled the world. And so before we, before we started any programs or did any initiatives or put out any requests for donations, we traveled the world. We went to India. We went to Sierra Leone. We went to Ghana. And we went and we sat in the slums and we, we slept with those people. We talked to them. We asked them questions. We asked them what family meant to them. We asked them, you know, to moms who had to give up their kids. Why, why did you, why did that happen? How did that make you feel? Um, and uh, while at the same time eating one egg on the side of a road being cooked on a charcoal grill with them and, and allowing them to trust us and know that we were there for mm -hmm. them. And so, you know, cu the couple of that with, um, you know, seeking wisdom and advice from people who uh, have been doing it for so long. I'm a millennial, so I have the tendency to think in an innovative way. <laughs> Everything for <from> millennials <laughs> seem to be about a new approach, a new way, totally. uh, you know, advancement. <laughs> and so I, I'm, I'm that way. I'm very, you know, innovative. I'm very risk uh, averse. Uh, I believe in, in taking risks, and I believe that uh, innovation is, is will allow us to continue and to develop. But also at the same time, it's by honoring the past and honoring how we've gotten to where we are, and to figure out, okay, well, there's been people who've been doing orphan care work for years and who have experience and knowledge and to be able to seek their advice and humble ourselves and learn from them and then to take what they've done and you know we're not trying to recreate the wheel but if <laughs> if i know anything about the wheel it's been advanced over the years and so every year it seems to get better and get better but it's not a crazy you don't completely change everything and so we've sought the wisdom and, and guidance and counsel of people who've been doing this for a long long time and then we've also traveled the world and we've sat in living rooms and on the floors and in the slums with people who were the beneficiaries that we wanted to impact and hear from them and learn from them and then to be able to put together a plan and put together some kind of programs that can go out and really make an effective impact rather than just the presence of one. Man, I, I love that intentionality. I love that you're doing that. Um, and as somebody who's a total millennial and loves doing things ways nobody else has done, that's definitely something I need to grow in is this idea of there's other people who have done stuff and it's worked out great and I should just learn from past wisdom uh, rather than just thinking that I can try something new and do my own thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's, it, is, it is an interesting dynamic. It is because there is, uh, uh, you know, because people have been doing things for so long, there is that dynamic that they will bring a little sense of jadedness, a little sense of comfort, a little sense of uh, this is the, you know, that we try, we, we have one saying around here that you cannot say, well, this is the way it's always been, mm. but we don't want, you can't say that around here. And, you know, that's when you kind of seek guidance and advice for people, that's kind of, they don't necessarily mean to all the time, but they want to press upon their their uh, values and their experiences and make sure you know, hey, be wary of this and be wary of that. And so you don't want to become too guarded by that. And so we've been very, you know, we've learned through mistakes, honestly. We've made many mistakes and we've failed in a lot of areas, but we've made sure that we learn from those failures and approach failure as an opportunity to grow and to learn and to build. Um, but it's, it's been good and, and it's been, it's been interesting. We met some incredible people. We've heard some inc some of the most amazing stories. Um, but that's and that, that's what it is, and that's what it's it's there for us, and it's there for the taking if we will just seek it and, and go after it. What's the big picture for let's say the next ten years? Where do you want to take I'm me? Uh, where do you want to? Uh, in what ways do you want to continue making more impact? And there's, there's a wave happening right now. And like I talked about a little bit earlier, it's uh, of the 167 million orphans, which is all, all a crazy statistic. And those are just the ones that UNICEF and the UN can document. 80% um, of them have a mother and or father alive somewhere. And also, like I talked about, we went around the world and we talked to people. And we talked to a lot of these parents who had given up their children, uh, moms who had to go to orphanages and knock on their door and ask if they can 
take their kids and, and, and give up their kids or dads who couldn't afford to take care of them anymore and had to just abandon their child on the side of the road and hope that somebody could pick him up and give them better in life than he could. And we started to ask them. We started to get a little peek into their lives. And it's, what's crazy is that we started to figure out that a vast majority of them actually had been abandoned and given up themselves. Mm, and so we started to see this cycle and what we call the orphan cycle. And so it's orphans creating orphans instead of family creating family. And so you grow up and you're abandoned and you're living in an institution or an orphanage and you don't, you don't experience the love of a family, the love of a father, the love of a mother, the support, encouragement. I am where I am and, and the person I am because of my family. I knew that if I failed, I could go home and they would be there to lift me up and encourage me and obviously discipline and teach me if I needed to be. But if I succeeded, they were the first ones to give me high fives and tell me they're proud of me and tell me that, uh, that, I, that I matter. And to be able to have that support on both sides of the spectrum was huge. And so we believe that every child should have that. Every child should have that loving, nurturing, caring, and, and secure environment. And so that's what 10 years from now, I mean, hopefully by tomorrow, our mission and our approach is to go in, to end that orphan cycle. And there's a wave happening right now in the orphan care world and people are starting to get away from the typical orphan orphanages and the institutions and, and starting to focus more on orphan prevention. Mm. And so it's going, so when the mom and dad come to uh, our gates and our mom and, or dad come to our gates and ask, you know, can you take care of my son because I can't afford it or I can't take care of him, I, I can't do it. We can say, no, actually, we won't take your kid, but how about we give you a job so that you can keep yours and so that you can, so your child is raised by his mom, by his dad, whatever that may look like. And so we started to experience that and started to implement that approach and have seen some amazing results and some beautiful, beautiful stories come out of that. And so uh, for the next 10 years, you know, we hope to be able to go and to be able to prevent child abandonment, to prevent family separation, and prevent orphans from being orphans. It's incredible. I love that you're doing all of this. And back to the football side of things, I know that there's been some concern in the world of football about you or players like you who are focusing on these things that are outside of the football world, you know, these outside passions or jobs or whatever. And it sounds like the Steelers, your last team, were super supportive of what you're doing in Haiti. And you're a free agent right now. You're, you're, you told me earlier you're waiting on a call and, you know, it could happen this very moment. But what's your thought process as, you know, you might have a new team soon on, on what your relationship with traveling to Haiti could look like? Yeah. And that, and like I said, I never want to try to, I don't want to act like I, I have it all figured out. I never want to try to present myself as somebody because I, I don't and I haven't. And I've approached things in a, uh, especially with, you know, my profession and maybe a little, a little bit, a little bit too much, too abrasive. Uh, and a lot of it was because, you know, earlier you and I kind of talked about, you know, just the difference between foundations and organizations. And, and a lot of times you'll have players start a foundation while they're playing and hire an executive director and hire a staff of people to come in and run it and lead it. And then the player kind of shows up for the camp or whatever they're doing. And, you know, that, and that's great. And that's, that's totally fine. And I have nothing, nothing against that. And I'm not trying to say that that's wrong in any, any regards, but that wasn't for me. If you know my personality, I'm either all in or not at all. I'm not going to do something, especially and put my name on something and then just kind of sit back and let somebody handle it. And so I'm in it and I'm involved. I'm the CEO. I run the day to day operations. And so I'm involved in this organization, not just in founding it, but also in the execution and the daily operations of it. And so when I was a free agent last year, uh, that started to raise some, a little bit of a red flags for some, from some organizations and some teams, uh, mainly just in the sim, this, this standpoint of just un, wanting to know where my commitment was, wanting to know where my heart was, wanting to know that if you know, they're investing a lot of this money, these money into these players, they want to know what they're going to get out of it. I mean, it's a business transaction in, in, in some, some ways. And so they were more looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, are we going to trust that you're going to put all that you have into the, into the team? Are you going to be committed? Are you going to be distracted? Are you going to be a distraction? Are you going to try to ask all of our players to go do events and keep them out late at night and then they can't practice effectively? And so they were all legitimate questions. Uh, it just, for whatever, it rubbed me the wrong way, the way it was presented. Um, and I felt like I was being put in the situation where I was given an ultimatum. And so the way a lot of teams and organizations were presenting contracts were basically, if you sign this, 
you have to, you can't do this. And there were sort of certain things they were telling me I couldn't do and mm. that I wasn't able to do. And so I saw that as an opportunity and I've, I've seen it as an opportunity because a lot of players have the heart that I have. A lot of guys in the locker room and the NFL gets a bad rap, but a lot of guys in the locker rooms have heart just like I do and want to be involved and want to do things, want to start their own organization and travel and do certain things, but uh, don't feel like it's going to be well received and don't feel like it's something that they can uh, do and have the support of their team. And so they're kind of, they wait back. And so a lot of guys are waiting until they're done playing. And so I've kind of taken, taken the approach just to spearhead that and to trailblaze that and to show guys that you know what if what if actually doing I'm me and being involved actually makes me a better football player because when I go out to practice and I drop a pass I'm, I'm, I approach it a lot differently than I did before because the, the things that were just uh, devastating and so important and, and just rocked my world before that was so fleeting and so uh, just small now I approach it, now I, I, I appreciate my teammates more and I support them and I encourage them and it's no longer about me and elevating myself, but it's about the team. And, and what if obviously being a football player helps my philanthropy efforts, which it does. And so trying to change that dynamic and change that conversation and, and that conversation, and it's been good. I've had, had a, <laughs> I was able to speak with Derek Jeter and uh, um, Kimbe Matumbo at an, at an NYU event a couple of months ago. Incredible. Which was just, an amazing opportunity for me. I was starstruck the whole time. <laughs> I love but just that. being able to have those and, and start those conversations and allow guys to see that, you know, you have the platform now and you have the ability to make an impact now. And if you don't want to, then great. But if you do, you shouldn't have to feel like you're scared or feel like you're, you're handcuffed. And so, you know, teams have asked now. And now with that, I also have to know that I cannot walk into a situation and just feel like I should be able to do what I want because that's not the case either. Totally. And so... You know, we, um, we, like last year with the Steelers and even this year, it's, you know what, I'm making a commitment. If I'm going to play football, I'm giving it all that I have. And so when I'm there and I'm at the practice facility or in the meeting rooms, I am all there. I am present. They get all of me. Now, I'll still run the organization, but I also have to make sacrifices. I can't travel to Haiti during the season. It's just not realistic, and it's <laughs> probably not in my or the team's best interest. Um you know, I can't go to events, I can't travel, but I, I, I can do what I can do there in the time frame that I have available and that's presented to me. And I'm willing to do that. And, and teams have been uh, very receptive to that and have started to open up to that. And so we're continuing that conversation, but it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. I love hearing this behind the scenes, this thought process. And, you know, I mentioned this before, but coming from totally outside the world of sports, I'm incredibly inspired by the way that you have this platform that you've been given and for you it's NFL, but uh, you know, for anybody else, it could be any number of things. Your platform can be the neighborhood that you live in or the people you spend your time with or whatever your job is really in a lot of ways. And you've taken that platform and you've decided to leverage it to make an impact and not just make an impact, but make an impact in a way that's unique to you. And so I just really, really appreciate hearing your story and getting to know that. So thank you. Man, my pleasure. And that's, you know, like you said, that's what's, that's what's so beautiful about this life we live and uh, has been just uh, extremely encouraging and, and just liberating for me is that, you know, one of our slogans at our organization is something I also believe in wholeheartedly is that every voice, every story, every person matters. And I have literally seen one person change an entire community uh, in Africa by their obedience and just by stepping up and saying that, you know what, I may not have the uh, platform and thousands of followers or you know, a huge bank account, but I do have what I do have, which may be your abilities or your skill set or passions or talent or goofiness, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's been so cool just with the, the concept of just our organization and our name, it's just encouraging people to be themselves. And I've, we've seen people, uh, I mean, swim, uh, <laughs> miles that they've never done before just to raise money or raise support for orphans. We've seen people use their talents, whether it be art or music, to raise support or uh, awareness for our kids. Not even necessarily for our organization, but just throughout my experience with this. It's been so beautiful to see people stand up and say, you know what, no longer will I listen and abide by quote unquote status quo of, you know what, I have to, that, that thought that I have to be somebody or have a certain amount of money or reach this possession or, or position in my company before I can really make a difference. Mm. Uh, I've seen single moms who 
our work as a cafeteria lady uh, at an elementary school make a impact on a child in Haiti with cerebral palsy that you like you would never imagine and in a way that couldn't be done if she had a bank account and money didn't have anything to do with it and so it's uh, that's what you know I encourage and challenge people and, and believe in so much is that no matter who you are where you come from what social economic status you have or background you come from or what your past may look like or current situation is that you can do something and that you can change the world in some way or some shape or fashion just by being yourself and by believing in your voice and by believing in what you have and your abilities and using that to help and to serve other people. Beautiful. I want to transition straight from that into every single episode. I love to ask every guest three questions and uh, I'm going to ask you them. And the first one is this, how would you describe the kind of person that you most admire in the world? Oh, wow. Somebody who, um, man, I'm thinking of like three or four different people. (laughs) Um, Somebody who has the ability to uh, overcome, who has the strength and and ability and just that belief to overcome, whether it be physically, emotionally, mentally, um, just overcome obstacles, adversity, um, that can take a a beating and keep pushing, keep striving, keep going. People, anybody who can see the good in situations, Mm. Um, something that, you know, yes, you may walk into Haiti, which is a third world country and take it for what it is, which is a third world country, uh, one of the the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, um, you know, HIV ridden, AIDS, earthquake, destruction, chaos, poverty, or you can see it for the beauty that it is, which uh, is a Caribbean country and the people are always laughing and dancing and there's so much beauty. Uh, People who aren't afraid, somebody who's not afraid to say I love you or to say I believe in you or support somebody and that builds people up instead of bringing them down. And just somebody who's awesome. (laughs) Somebody who is just captivating and magnetic. Uh, I'm thinking of Bob Goff who wrote the book Love Does, just off the top of my head, just somebody outside of my family who just I want to be around and just I want to just listen to and sit down and lunch with just because he I could have the worst day ever and just step into that man's presence for five or ten seconds and automatically I'm liberated and automatically my entire approach is changed and so you know that's the people who I admire is just to be able to either see a situation that's maybe miserable or bad and be able to see the good in it or physically be able to make a bad situation good beautiful answer i love that um man those are my favorite people too um (laughs) question number two is what are you consuming right now that you love so like one thing like a tv show a book a movie something like that oh man I've really been big. Obviously, the Olympics are going on right now, <laughs> yes. so I love that. Yes. Um, I'm a big reader, too. I've been reading a couple of good books. There's one called Creativity, Inc. Uh, by the founder. Oh, and Pixar. Um, creator of Pixar. It's fantastic. So good. I love to read. The new Harry Potter book just came out. A little bit of a Harry Potter geek. I'm halfway so into it. Don't there. judge me. Or don't... <laughs> I'm, don't spoil it for me because I'm... Yeah, I am I just got started, so I don't have anything to spoil yet. I'm trying to take it slow. Man, I like to that's just me too. To dive into it. I normally, but, back in the day, I would dive into them so fast, but now I'm just taking it so slow because it's it's going to be gone it's, soon. It's And it's kind of hard to read. I mean, yeah, with, the, it's a script. with the, the play, and it's the hard, you know, I can't really tell which character is which, but you're right. It is. I'm the same way. I jump into it, but I, it, this is it. And so I want to make sure I take it all in. <laughs> but I don't know what it is, man. But like lately, I've been a big binger. I've been crushing some Netflix. Good. I've been watching some shows. I don't usually have time for it. But lately, I've, I mean, Parks and Rec, I watched the entire Dude. season series of The Office. Uh, um, you have the best I'm getting taste. getting big I into Scandal now. Dude, Scandal, <laughs> Scandal will hook you in. I had to like force myself to stop at like, I don't know what season they're on, but... I made it through so many and I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm an addict. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had something more life changing, something more depth, something with more depth, but, uh, yeah, I'm consuming Harry Potter, uh, <laughs> Parks and Rec, The Office and Scandal. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's, it's so refreshing though, because a lot of like, I've had people, you know, I ask this question to people all the time, like in my regular life and stuff. And, uh, and people will be like, I'm reading and it's like some scientific journal or it's and i'm like oh like i'm reading harry potter so 
<laughs> it's great. Yeah, comparison's a lie. I, I can get into that too. I can get into that. like, man, I'm not to your status, am I? And it can just get discouraging. It's like I like to have fun. I like to just let loose and you know, I love to live and help people but at the same time. There's some good stuff out there and Harry Potter's one of them. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Uh my last question is based on the ways that you've chosen to step out and live your life differently, what's one thing you'd encourage someone else to do in their own life? Man, that is such a good one. Uh, I would just have to say, make a point to learn something new every day, whether it be about yourself, whether it be about your profession, whether it be about other people or somebody close to you. Um, you know, that's what <laughs> has gotten me to where I am. It is not even necessarily um, about me setting goals and saying, I'm going to reach those goals. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to reach those goals unless I had the knowledge of how to attain them and how to achieve them. And so that's been, uh, you know, it, it, it creates and it invites an element of uh, humility. And it also creates and invites other people to get involved and have a sense of ownership in your process. And it has allowed me to, you know, by seeking other people and seeking something to learn or letting them know that they have helped me in certain ways, uh, that I now have a community of people and a support group or a council or whatever you want to call it, who don't feel like... I'm always coming to them just when I need something or uh, they feel but feel invested and feel like this is much more than just a transaction. It's a relationship. And so, uh, you know, that's what it's 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 a beautiful journey, uh, you know, step out in faith like you're talking about. But it's it's difficult. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's the easy <laughs> because the road less traveled is the road less traveled for a reason. And you're going against the current and you're swimming. And so it's hard and it's difficult and it's exhausting. And there's days where you think you can't go any further. Um, but if you continue to push and you have that community and that have that support to be able to push you through it, because there's been days, I'm going to be honest with you, the days where I wanted to quit and I didn't want to keep going. I didn't think I had what it took or I was going to just say, okay, well, now nah, I'm just going to be a football player for now. Um, but there's people who saw something in me who wouldn't let me quit. And those conversations were started by seeking the guidance and seeking to learn something about myself, whether it be good or bad, and being honest with myself. And so that's not always easy. And that's not something that we necessarily want to do. It's something we have to be intentional about. And, uh, but it does pay tremendous reward and tremendous dividends. Learn something new every day and take the road less traveled and work hard without quitting. I love that. Man. You made it sound really simple. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my job. I love it. Uh, David, man, I'm so glad that we got to have you on the show today. If people want to follow along with what you're up to, if they want to find out more about your organization and follow you online, where can they do that? Yeah, I mean, I love social media is the most beautiful tool in the world. I love to interact and engage with people. So please hit me up on Instagram, follow Twitter, whatever it may be at David Nelson 86. And then our organization is easy across the board, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at I M M E underscore org. Easy. So good, man, man. And I'm not smart enough to make things complicated. <laughs> so we try to keep things simple. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, you had so much incredible insight to offer today. I know that I'm coming away encouraged, inspired, ready to take action. And I have no doubt that other people listening are feeling the exact same way. So thank you so much for being here, David. Hey, man, I appreciate you. And I just appreciate what this what this uh, entire podcast and what you're doing and giving people a chance and giving them a voice and a microphone to speak and encouraging people and inspire men. You're doing it. And I appreciate you and all that you do and all that you are. So thank you for that. Man, that means a lot. Man, I, uh, <laughs> I'll i talk to you soon. Sounds good. Let me know how that Rocky series goes and, and we'll catch up with Harry Potter, I guess, when we both finish it, huh? <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yes, please. <laughs> Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is part of the Gradient Podcast Network and is created in collaboration between me, Brandon Harvey, and Gradient. Check them out at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Thank you so much to each of you who tuned into the podcast this week. If this is your first time listening, subscribe to the show, just tap the little button, to get a new inspiring story downloaded straight to your phone next week and every week. If you really connected with this episode, let's totally talk about it. You can find me on Twitter, 
and on Instagram with the username at Brandon Harvey. That's Brandon with an E. And with that, that's a wrap for this week's podcast. I'll see you next week when we get the opportunity to learn from another inspiring person. Sound good?